It's not very nice to be able to welcome Lorraine McLaughlin here tonight to speak to us and her presentation is entitled Barbara Robertson and the Celebration of South Australian Women Artists. Lorraine's background is in teaching and she taught English for many years in Australia and in Singapore before venturing into other areas of employment. She became interested in the work of Barbara Robertson through a physical location. She was living at Yankalilla and Barbara Robertson lived at Karakalinga, but I will leave Lorraine to tell us more about that connection. This led her to writing and publishing a book on the life of Barbara Robertson, published in 2009. This evening she will speak about her book and the context in which Barbara Robertson painted. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you very much, Jeff, and good evening, and thank you for coming out on a cold night when the Olympics are on and lots of other things. <laughs> and I am delighted to be here because um, as nervous as I am when I get confronted not only with historians and serious people, and then I meet a, a former colleague whom I know is a, an art historian and an art specialist who used to work at the art gallery and I think well Jeff found it difficult to know why I would, had written this book because I'm neither an artist nor an historian um, but I did write it because I was passionate about the work of Barbara Robertson. I met her in Yankalilla. I first saw her work at an exhibition that Flinders University put on that uh, Dr Paula Furby um, organised in 2000-2001 and I was quite blown away by that and uh, in 2005 and 2007 I was the organiser of the uh, Levy Sea Dragon Festival in the Yankalilla district and in that second festival when I thought I had nothing else to do but organise a festival I thought I might do an exhibition of Barbara Robertson and people came and were staggered and lots of out of town people came and really paid tribute to the work of Barbara and because I had done a little bit of work to find out about her background, I thought, there's a book in this, I'll give it my best shot. And it's not a perfect work. I didn't find out everything I needed to know. I've found lots out since. I give talks and people come up to me and say I was in her class, I knew her this way or that way. Um, the various links I've made tonight are people saying how they know about me or about my book or about Barbara Robertson. It was a, a terrific journey for me to work with Barbara, a quite elderly and frail lady when I got to know her, and sadly died just short of her 90th birthday in October last year. And in some ways it's a bit difficult for me to talk about her tonight because this is the first time I've done so publicly since that time. I know biographers are not meant to get too involved with their subject matter, but as somebody said to me coming in tonight, which she'd been a student of Barbara's and Barbara was a woman of grace and she did enchant all people who met her. But she was very quiet and um, didn't put herself forward and it wasn't for a lot of people to get to know her that well. Her students loved her, her friends loved her and her community loved her. She was born in 1921 and this is a self-portrait the graphic artist chose what would go on the front. I wouldn't have chosen that. I actually own this painting and love it, but I think it works really well. It was very difficult to know what to put on the cover because Barbara was an artist with a very large range of work. She did still lifes, she did um, a lot of portraits, but it wouldn't have been suitable to put those portraits on the cover. But for her to put a self-portrait when she was about 30, to have that on, um, I think, works a treat. How do you, how, where does a, an artist like Barbara, I've said she's very self-effacing and quiet, how did she get to be such a, a passionate painter? And there were, one of the very large influences on her life was her father. He was a wonderful pho photographer, Eric Robertson. There was a lot of Scottish in the blood, as uh, Jeff has said, both sides of the family and uh, the Scottish traditions were very important to them. But the father was um, a farmer 
and he didn't make much of a fist of it. He must have had a gentle nature too, I think, and he was often taken advantage of. And particularly um, during the years of the Depression, things went bad and he's made a bad land swap in the Currency Creek area and he came to Adelaide to live and he worked, had an orangery at one stage. He didn't make a lot of money and the situation was fairly straightened for them. So um, he worked for Kodak and he was such a good photographer and he was well known and he was a great draw card for Kodak because he had his photographs in the windows and um, people came up and queued up to um, get advice from Eric Robertson. And if you were, weren't uh, careful, you might have been grabbed by Eric himself and taken home um, nicely. Um, for a photo session because he'd dress you up as a Dickens character or whatever and uh, he was an amateur photographer but he exhibited these photographs around the world and uh, he had a son Douglas ten years older than um, Barbara uh, but Barbara as a, a gentle soul he was very nurturing of her and he believed in her and I guess if, if you want to inherit good parents and, and you're going to be an artist. The first thing is somebody who'll teach you to draw, as he did, and got her interested in photographs, and she loved to work with him in his uh, dark room, and she was just fascinated by those, photo those faces as they emerged from the photographs. Um, but the other thing that um, being a parent makes all the difference about was that that father believed in Barbara and b made her believe that she had talent. She went to Walford and, um, of course, in those days art wasn't in the curriculum, but there were art lessons after school and so he made sure she had those and he taught her to draw. Um, I told you my book's not perfect. Somebody stood up at one talk that I gave and said, if they were in such straightened means, how about what was the story about Walford? And I didn't know until after the book came out and uh, Barbara said to me, you know, I was lucky to go to Walford because my grandfather was a GP and he used to look after the girls at Walford and so I was allowed to go for very low fees. Her mother was interested in flower arranging, that comes out in all the family histories and Barbara did say perhaps I inherited my sense of colour from my mother, I did have a good sense of colour. Under a little bit of duress, I could get her to say some statements like that, but she was very, very modest. Barbara Robertson's own art was reasonably derivative. She took other things and changed them and made them her work, and that's what she did to win when she was just a teenager a uh, state competition for a poster. And the Art Gallery of South Australia has quite a few of Eric Robertson's photographs. But that's the influence and the, the talk around home and these photographs that he took were exhibited in magazines around the world. So there were lots of art and photographic magazines in the household. After Barbara left school, she stayed home for a year because that's what girls were likely to do. Um, and help with the cooking. Her father wasn't very well and he was diabetic and there weren't refrigerators and deep freezers so the cooking and running a household was a pretty big job at the time. And then after that she went part time to the South Australian School of Arts and Crafts and probably don't have to tell you as a group of historians what building that is but it was the Jubilee building which was pulled down in 1962 for the Napier building to be built next door to Benipen Hall. While Barbara was studying there she also um, taught drawing to younger uh, girls because there was a girls school in there for people who were pre-selected for having art artistic potential and, uh, and girls still at school were brought into that, bu that building and that school and uh, I've even met people who were taught by Barbara in that circumstance. She was taught by some very good teachers and one of them was Ivor Hill. She thought he was fantastic. He showed her how to get proportions and, and facial proportions correct. 
and he showed showed that he might help with the drafting of that just slightly but then he wouldn't draw on her work but all the things that are around the edge are actually the work of Ivor Hill on the edge of the sketch that she was doing. Mary P. Harris is known by lots of people in the art world because she was a passionate um, teacher of the history of art and Barbara loved her. She would talk about the wonderful language that Mary Harris used and it was that, that was the only entree Barbara had. Um, modestly said, well, she was glad she couldn't go overseas because then she could just be free to be herself. And I think that was partly because she was a gracious person and didn't yearn for things she couldn't have and couldn't afford. But um, looking at a documentary that Margaret Ollie was speaking on the other night, she said in that that when she went overseas it took her some time when she came back to get that out of her system and move on to work out who she wanted to be and what kind of an artist she was in her own right. After she'd been to art school, Barbara went to Adelaide Teachers College and Barbara had a really happy time at Teachers College. And there are photographs of her and stories of people from Teachers College days. I met up with some of them in the pub one day and they told me lots of stories. Barbara was with me, but she didn't recall the detail herself. So that was one of the difficulties of writing a book using someone's memories when she didn't get the detail. But those other people that I was with could give me year and date and she'd agree with them, but she did, couldn't. it was hard to try get that out of her in many instances anyway. Those associations and those people coming to see her and ringing up and all those connections um, gave her a lot of joy. Every time I'd give a, a talk I'd be going back and I'd say, well I met this person and this person and this person and, and she was very really delighted by uh, that recognition of what an impact she'd had on lots of other people. I did say happy days when she was at Adelaide Teachers College, but Barbara was a gentle soul and going out teaching, as she had to do to fulfil her bond, wasn't a great joy. In fact, it was hard for her and she didn't make much of a go of it, going to Port Adelaide Tech, Girls Tech and to Theberton Girls Tech. Then she went to Norwood Girls Tech. There was a teacher there, a senior teacher, who re recognised her school and sponsored her to go after she finished her, um, worked out her bond, to go to Melbourne to study at the National Gallery of Victoria. That person was Vita McGay, who was the principal of Adelaide Girls High School and quite a significant um, educator and a tireless worker for women's rights, tireless worker for the union and um, the old Institute of Teachers used to have a building, the McGay building there. And it was because I said that at a, a meeting like this that someone s challenged me and said, Vita McGay wouldn't have had any money. Her father was actually a, a warder at the jail. But she was adopted and she did come into money later and she did sponsor. Because I put everybody off by saying that she went to Walford. Well, she did go to Walford, but she didn't have a lot of money to enable that to happen. She was lucky. And she was lucky to have a sponsor who helped her and assisted her to go to Melbourne for two years. It wasn't easy to get in, and a lot of people who have been through there are big names now. And John Brack, um, Fred Williams, a lot of important people. Oh, my goodness, I was so frustrated trying to find out what Barbara had done when she was over there with these people, but I didn't get too many stories. She said, I just was so excited to be able to paint. You know, when she was at um, the South Australian School of Arts and Craft, she would go and have a lesson for two hours a week painting in situ there, and then she'd go home. She didn't have a studio, and then she'd come back next week and paint for another two hours in the class. So when she got to um, Melbourne, she thought it, it was just wonderful because she went to the... National Gallery, it was quite a status thing to do, but it was quite conservative. She was there in the times of the, the conservatives and the modernists um, and a schism between them. At the time it was the museum, it was the art gallery and it was the library. It still remains the um, Victorian State Library and it's a fine, fine building much added on to. But that's where Barbara went. 
because all the masters are hanging around the walls, the plaster casts are around, um, there are models there, and Barbara could paint there all day. And that was for her a studio amongst other people doing it. And it was just for her so liberating, so exciting. The major, one of her major teachers was William Dargie, later Sir William Dargie, and he was quite conservative. I have interviewed Barbara and made a DVD, which is in the back cover of the book. And on that she says at least three times, Dargie was a wonderful teacher, even though I didn't like his art. She, was, she, wanted, she didn't want to be a modernist, she wanted the techniques. And uh, he was very much a tonalist painting, um, a painter and um, from the Max Meldrum school or influenced by that. And that's what she wanted was the techniques. But she didn't think he went far enough. She didn't think his portraits were very good. They didn't go deep enough. She says some of that. The models uh, are in, in this picture and I found out from my friends who went there in the 60s that sometimes the models were just rounded up from the pub which was at the back door. I don't think that was the scene that Barbara was in and I don't think she was in the cafe scene. I just tried so desperately to get stories out of her but you can't put words in people's mouths because she probably didn't do any of that bohemian stuff. But she did paint some very fine portraits when she was there. Isn't that beautiful? It's only little. And one of the joys and excitements of putting together a book like this was that I got around to some wonderful collectors of art and saw Barbara's paintings amongst that. And this little one was in the kitchen of some affluent people. It was just, it's just, it just glows. It's so beautiful. But there's quite a few other paintings of Barbara's there alongside the Clifton pews and Lawrence doors. And, and I got very excited. Well, I told you that I couldn't get any stories out of Barbara about what she did when she was over there. And then one day she found this photograph. She said, would you be interested in this? No, sorry. First of all, I found a person in Yankalilla who said she stayed an extra year at school because Barbara taught her ballet. And her mother was really cross that she still stayed on at school because she wasn't doing much work, but she liked Barbara's ballet classes after school. So I went to Barbara and I said, when did you take ballet classes? Now, I've been a school teacher and I've taught phys ed and all sorts of things that I'm not very well equipped to do. And that's what I thought she was talking about. She jumped up, went and got this photo. And she said, can you use this? I said, Barbara, what? She said, oh, I taught, I, when I was in Melbourne, I was taught by a famous art, um, dance teacher. So she was taught in the Martha Graham style of dance and she was very gracious and her father took this photograph and she said, well, I did hold the pose for at least a second. But she was gracious and graceful. And so she was doing other things when she was in, in Melbourne that I, I wasn't asking the right questions. Well, she wasn't only inside she was out sketching as well and Dargi sent them out to do that. Dargi taught her to draw and taught her a lot what well, she learned from Ivor Hill as well but um, Dargi taught her a lot of those techniques but when she painted she wasn't allowed to draw at all and she just had to get in and cover that canvas with paint and half close her eyes and see where the dark and light were and, and get the shape from the face in there and then go work on the detail. I made a list, you don't have to remember them and I won't test you after this session, but that, that's the list of um, William Dargie's Archibald wins. It just seems cruel to me that um, Barbara was hung twice in the Archibald. The first time there was an honourable mention for her and Ivor Hill won. The second time she was in, William Dargie won. Now, they were both successful men and what a difference it would have made if, they, if she'd pipped them instead of the other way around. But she was a very able portrait painter. After two years in Melbourne, she came home. She was, co it, she was cold. She was not well. It, it was a, a difficult place to live, Melbourne. And um, 
she came home and painted here in South Australia. She painted in Grote Street, she had a studio there for a little while. Again, it was Vita McGay who was paying for that. And that list there is just of the subject matter that Barbara um, painted. A lot of it was um, social comment, poor people, disadvantaged people, Aboriginal people. She had a very strong conscience and she says on the DVD vehemently several times about how badly we've treated Aboriginal people and they were to become her subject matter later in life. Um, she did portraits, she did still lifes, she drew animals, religious painting and then she did a very important series of um, St Francis of Assisi, Australian series of that and also a series of mandalas and we'll come to all of those. This is a backdrop of a painting, of a, not a painting, this is the only uh, crayon pastel that she did, that we still have. Um, and that's on a rooftop. She looked out over those rooftops and she saw this rather simple woman, she thought, who was much abused by the man that she lived with and uh, she had a lot of compassion for that. It's a very beautiful piece of work. Someone has an option on it, but I think it should be in a public place. I think it's so good. And all of this is very true to what was there. That's another self-portrait after she returned from um, Melbourne when she was in that studio. Um, this previously was on sale at Kensington Gallery, and I like to acknowledge the work that Susan Sedaris and Barbara uh, Russell did at uh, Kensington Gallery in supporting women and certainly supported Barbara and promoted her work, had a retrospective of her work in um, 1998 in Kensington Gallery. That's one of several paintings that were bought um, for the Art Gallery in recent years. So it would be a good idea if you went in there and said, can we see the Barbara Robertson paintings? Because they're not hung, of course. At this stage she was exhibiting with the um, Contemporary Art Society of South Australia and the Royal Society and winning prizes with them. Barbara painted on mason art or board um, because she couldn't afford canvases really and what they did with that was they slit it down because it had another painting on the back, an unfinished self-portrait. This is a luscious portrait and that just shows how she used colours, reds and greens there. I actually own this one and I can't tell you what a joy it was to sit at my dining room table with my husband who's an artist and Barbara as they talked about how she'd done it. And for her to see it again with new eyes because she lived in a house that didn't have any art in it. The person that she lived with thought that it would be better more light in the house if you didn't have paintings on the wall. And here's this artist without any of her art. And I've taken her to various places, shown her her art in various places, told her where I've seen her art. And it's been a great thrill for her to be able to see those again. But when she came and she talked with Peter about how this was painted, she was just in another world. And this luscious. She couldn't make a living painting so she went to teach at Adelaide Girls High School and there was the wonderful Vita McGay. Vita McGay who was famous for riding a motorbike to school in, in the 1940s and 50s and wearing her black leathers. She was much loved by her staff, used to have great parties for them with champagne and um, lobster, crayfish. And she was a great champion of Barbara's and a great supporter. And Barbara would say, I couldn't have done, I couldn't have taught anywhere else. I got so, such wonderful support from Vita McGay and it was a great school to work in. And someone has talked about being taught by Barbara and how she's a woman of grace. All the people who did art with her loved her. People who, in those days you couldn't do art if you were smart. So people in, had to do science. Well, they, people doing desperate things to get their way into Barbara's classes. And of course, Barbara had to teach because her father was unwell. 
and he died in 1955. She had to teach to help support the family. But she was a girl teacher, so she didn't get as much as the boys. And she was also an art teacher, so that wasn't a proper teacher, was it? So you didn't get as much as the maths and the English teachers. So this is to put you in the context of, of the times that a woman artist was trying to make her way. That was hung in the Archibald in 1955. I met the woman that that was painted, of which that was painted, in her 70s. And she looked like that. Well, the spirit of the face. I know that when Gertrude Stein was painted by Picasso, she said, that's not what I look like, and he said, it will be. <laughs> and it's true with Barbara, I think. She gets in there and she gets the spirit of the person, so she captures something that is lasting. But Bronte, of whom this is painted, didn't like it at the time, but it's treasured now. This, I don't, doubt that you can see from the distance, it looks very dark, but that was hung in the Sawman, the big art prize that comes up with the win and, and Archibald every year, and um, it was mentioned. It is Aboriginal women on the edge of a town. In the, back, in the background, there are churches, there are office buildings, um, there's industry, and then the Aboriginal women in the front, sort of precluded from that core business. This one was honourably mentioned in the Melrose Prize. I thought, oh, I fancy going to a country show. But in fact, it was a very important art prize, but named after the director of the art gallery. By the time she got through the painting in the 60s, she was quite disillusioned and well, she, Adelaide Girls High School was becoming Adelaide Girls and Boys High School combined and she didn't want to be there when the boys came so she went off to teach at one of the girls tech schools where she was very challenged and they took her out of there and they put her in Wattle Park Teachers Resource Centre and that's where she ended her educational um, career. She was actually very well regarded, she was a um, public exam board examiner of art and so on but when she went to Wattle Park Resource Centre, um, she worked with Colin Tearley and she had great affinity with another creative spirit. So her teaching time did end happily, but she was on the edge there for a while. When she retired so that she could paint full time, she dried up. What could she do? She just couldn't get it back. So she had to reinvent herself. And she's sitting around with a few friends having a glass of wine and decided that she'd be, change her persona and she'd paint as a middle-aged, jovial, jovial, a little bit lecherous man. And she said it was great fun. So she just imagined herself as someone altogether different and she got going again. She never exhibited under any other name, but she loosened up and then she got back to being the old Barbara. Not that she didn't get some criticism. Max Harris wrote one criticism, one review of her work and said that she painted fingers like sausages. She didn't, uh, she said she didn't mind that. Um, later on, after she got over the, you know, started painting again, he did write some good and positive reviews of her work. So she moved on from that to paint animals, a lot of animals. She was an absolutely mad save the animals. She was a pacifist. She was a vegetarian because she shouldn't eat meat. And then because she had never had good commissions to paint, I mean, I should have, show, should have mentioned when we were doing the list of um, Dargie's wins in the Archibald, they were all Essington Lewis and the Honourable and the Sir and well, Albert Namatjira was a little different and, and interesting, but they were all the suits and... Uh, she painted her students and her friends and children and that's not a way to be a famous um, portrait artist. But she could combine her love of faces and her painting of um, people with her religious um, interests. She was in and out of the Anglican church for some time 
And uh, this this is a series of wonderful paintings of hers down in the Yankalilla Anglican Church. There are quite a few of them, and they look quite amazing in situ. They're large and passionate and bold, but that's not open as a gallery. Um, that's another painting with masks, as the one before was, and the old story of Judas betraying Christ. Now, some people have pointed out to me, though Barbara denied it, she said, I wouldn't do that. But some people said, after 30 years, this, ha this face of Judas actually looks like a young Max Harris. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, she said. I wouldn't deliberately do that. It's very bold and it's very severe painting and, and very moving. Then she does this St Francis Australis series where she incorporated the face of David Golpalil as St Francis. And this, from her point of view, was a tribute to Aboriginal people who loved the country, loved the animals. And they are quite stunning. And after I talked somewhere, someone came up to me and said they had six paintings of Barbara's. Would I like to come and see? And the prototype for this one, this one the... Um, the face, just of David Goldblum, she had hanging halfway up her stairs. Oh, it would be this big. Very moving to, after you've written a book, to see all of these wonderful things that have helped make the art that you've become fond of yourself. That's Barbara in older age, self-portrait. Why so serious, Barbara? And she told me I can't look into a mirror and smile at myself all the time. This is owned by the Western Australian Museum. It's um, in a big exhibition that's coming up at the end of the year. Um, they have a big collection of um, two, a self-portrait and a major piece of work um, of Australian women artists, and Barbara's been selected in that. And for the exhibition, they are hoping to put this one up because John Crothers, who has um, donated this huge collection that his family got together to the Western Australian, Western Australian University in their art gallery. It's a beautiful painting, if it weren't a horrible subject, of test tube experimentation on animals. But it's like an arabesque. They're so beautifully designed, and there's poetry and beauty and, and rhythm in the whole painting. And then she did this, which I like to call the Christ child, but which is really called The Lamb Will Lie Down with the Lion. Um, biblical references and it's come up quite well in the book I'm pleased because you can see there the aura around the Christ child it's a bit hard here but it, it's a very stylized painting and she was moving from those religious paintings on to the mandala phase and this is a beautiful mandala this is the 12 apostles and all of the apostles are down the side and they all have all the insignia of whatever St. Peter has the keys and uh, the Andrew the fisherman and so forth. This one's in Art Gallery of South Australia, one of the mandalas there. I don't like it as much as the others. That one's fabulous. Anglicare bought six of them and they've hung them in their aged care facilities in their chapels. And I've been to the launch and hanging of two of those and again, it's a very moving experience for me to be at something like that and see these in almost like altar pieces. And they're just beautifully stylized and designed. She also designed kneelers for the Anglican Church, pew kneelers and, and out the front at, at the altar. And just recently, after she died, someone gave me a tapestry that she'd made, which was all skew with, but it's actually ours and it is a joy. That was Uncle Alan and that's a fabulous Portrait. She loved Uncle Alan, they had a very uh, strong affinity and it's just a fabulous example of someone who really knows what they're doing, painting and somebody they love, getting the spirit of it across. Jester, now that's a, based on one of her father's photographs and you won't see but on the back, on the notice board, are bullets and entering flesh and um, this Hiroshima over here, the bomb going off, the mushroom cloud and so on. 
I asked, I gave a talk at Yankalala Area School and I said, do you think this is a good, for, good painting to go to a school? And the kids said, yes, of course it is. You know, we'd really like it. They understood what a jester was and that the jester might laugh, but it's really about serious things and we'll tell the king the truth. And uh, I said, but this is an artist at 12 school. We can't have the youngsters, can you? And uh, they said, oh, of course they can. So now I got that presented to the school and Barbara went along to the assembly and uh, they made much of her over that wonderful portrait of a local builder, a late local builder in our district who actually built Barbara's studio. She did have one at Karakalinga. And that's Barbara in 2009, just before the book came out. And that portrait's gone to Walford, along with a couple of other paintings that are there. She's smiling, not in the paintings she did of herself, though. Oh, she could smile. She had a wicked giggle. And she snorts, which I do when I get to laugh too much. My sister does too. Um, and that one day when she snorted, I said, oh, Barbara, that's why I love you, because you were also. And that's where I'll leave it, but that's a photograph of her in the last couple of years. So thank you very much. Thank you. What an amazing story. <laughs> um, I think we've actually heard two stories tonight. We've heard the um, life story of an artist, but also the story of how you put together your book and how you got to know the person, which I think is really great. Do we have some questions from the audience? How did Barbara end up at Yankalilla? She lived with two women. Um, in a house in Millswood um, and that's probably the house you went to after school because I know you're one of her art students and she used to have extra lessons for the talented ones. When her mother died, Barbara was forced to take in, make up part of the house as a flat and she took in people to live there and one of the people lived there. Um, Barbara, this isn't in the book and I don't know, got to edit it as I go. Uh, <laughs> Barbara was easily taken advantage of and she she had, had when the father died that the mother and Barbara died up divided up the house and she had a tenant. And then when her mother died she had a boarder and that boarder started to take advantage of her and so the tenant and her mother with the uh, support of Barbara's friend said, this mustn't go on, Barbara's easily taken advantage of, and so they changed the house back and the three of the women lived together. But I think Barbara was very happy to go. I think it was more the urging, I'm not sure, of the other two. Barbara loved the sea, and one of my dearest last memories of Barbara is taking her by the beach, and when I was taking her home from something and I said, oh, can't go home yet, I know it's lunchtime, but let's just go and look at the sea and she just talked about how she loves swimming in that sea at Karakalinga. Um, she missed Adelaide because she missed going to the theatre and concerts and so on and she left a lot of friends behind in Adelaide so it wasn't altogether a good thing for her, I don't think. Now I'm just being personal about my opinions. But she joined the art scene down there. She used to do, go to life drawing classes. Um, people tell me that even in those groups, she didn't say much until everybody else had had their say and then she'd just say something and it would make all the difference to the other people there. She was generous, spirited and helpful and supportive of other artists. I wanted to ask, um, I, I seem to remember there might be some, I don't know, um, controversy over the estate. Um, but if that's so, when she died, how many of the paintings did, were there at her, with her, and what's going to happen to them? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I have quite a few paintings um, stored um, of hers that haven't gone back to the studio that were in uh, Kensington Gallery, and um, Pam, who was the carer and shared the house with Barbara, said was happy for me to take them and you know maybe some of those will be donated to regional art galleries I have to yet I have yet to negotiate and talk to those galleries mm. but there is some work 
in Barbara's studio and I don't, it's, you know, the estate is still being wound up and um, I don't know what Pam will do with those works now. I must say I was interested to see her drawings done with Ivor mm -hmm. Hill as a, as a teacher. My father studied with Ivor Hill about the same time and we've got sketches too where my father's works in the middle and around the outside of bits and pieces of hands and fingers and mm. muscles mm. and things. Mm. Amazing work. Mm. And it's all in charcoal. Right. Well, most of it was charcoal, yeah. Certainly Barbara had a high regard for the lessons that she learned from Ivor Hill and she was greatly inspired by that. Mm. No doubt your father was. Oh, he was. Mm. Yeah. Was was she much appreciated and and um, in the in the lo in the Adelaide papers when she exhibited in these big surprises? Did she get much acknowledgement, or was she just overlooked? Fairly well overlooked. She was part of the Contemporary Art Society with Geoffrey Smart and Co. Um, and she liked being with them. She liked the fact that they were pushing the edges, and she knew that that they were more modernist. She didn't want to go that way, but she wanted to do with colour um, things that were quite different from the way she was taught by Dargie. She was well awarded in the Royal Arts Society and at the, you know, she won prizes in those places, but I don't think people made a fuss of her when she did well interstate. But I mean, I went to the New South Wales Gallery um, looking in their files and, and their catalogues and one of one time one of her works was in the catalogue I mean it was in those days you didn't have colour photography left right and centre like you do now and so they just they didn't have all of the paintings in there but hers was one of three or four in the in the catalogue and so on so she was well she was recognised but she wasn't the one to take it anywhere and she had to be a teacher and that drained her it's a hard job being a teacher much loved she was. I think her art room was over the back of the school and the kids used to come in and listen to classical music there. She saw that calmed them down. But they could also talk. And You remember these things, do you? Good. Lorraine, where did her father's photographic collection end up? Ah, oh, Barbara donated it to the um, art gallery. Okay. It's South Australian Art Gallery, so quite a lot of the work is there. Well, thank you, Lorraine. It's been a most enlightening talk, I've got to say. And every now and again we have a speaker come here who the subject matter is something we know nothing about, but we should. So thank you very much for bringing it to our attention.